Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along, you know that we've devoted February to celebrating amazing women in science, adventure, exploration, and conservation. We've had a whole bunch of great hangouts with scientists and explorers from all over the world, and we have a few more left to come up uh, to wrap the month. Before we meet today's guest, uh, Jess Cramp, we're going to take a quick moment and look at National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for where all of our classrooms are joining us from today. So just give me a second here to share my screen. That should be going now. All Explorer right. Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you Sounds like we're getting a little you know feedback from somewhere. Memory. There we go. All right. So here I am in Alora, Ontario, here in Canada at the Red X. And if we start to back up a little bit, some of our classrooms will come into focus. So back out from Ontario. We have classrooms joining us today in North Carolina, Tennessee, Kansas, Colorado. If we back out a little bit more, you can see we have some classrooms in British Columbia as well as joining us in California. And if we head out into the Pacific, maybe back out one more, you'll see we have Jess joining us today from the Cook Islands. Uh, and I use this fish. Everyone just pretend that's a big old shark, but it's it's not, it's a fish, but we'll pretend. And there's Jess joining us in the Cook Islands. So as I come back from the screen share, I just wanna remind any of the classrooms who are tuning in live on YouTube today, uh, you can still get in on the action. Use the chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions. We'll work them into the event. And any classroom, whether you're live on camera with us or watching on YouTube, take some pictures, post them on Twitter, use the hashtag Explore Classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education because we'd love to see classrooms in action. So uh, as mentioned, Jess is joining us today. Jess Cramp is a National Geographic Explorer, a shark researcher and marine conservationist who is passionate about stopping uh, the over exploitation of sharks uh, in our oceans. So she's volunteered for a lot of marine related projects in the past before settling in the Pacific in 2011. She lives in the Cook Islands where she manages the locally based Pacific Islands Conservation Initiative. So uh, recent big success uh, overwhelming the community through a, gr a grassroots campaign was able to rally them and result in protecting almost 800,000 square miles, creating the Cook Islands Shark Sanctuary. So Jess, it is always great when we can steal a little bit of your time uh, and have you hang out with our classrooms. Uh, we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about your conservation work, and then we're gonna fire away with some questions after. Sounds good. I am going to share my screen with you. All right, good start so far. I see me. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, can you see my presentation? Uh, it might just be just because your location it might be coming up a little bit slower, so we'll give it a second. Okay. But right now, I still see the screen with me. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> okay. Screen share. It says I'm screen sharing. <laughs> All right, so you're back now. Try hitting it. Um, it's going to bring it up again, and then just bring your presentation to the front, and that should take over. Yep. There we go. Don't have to look at me anymore. That's much better. Or me, even better. Okay, so you can see my presentation? We, we've got you, nice and full screen. Wonderful. Good morning, afternoon, um, and evening to you all. My name is Jess Cramp, as Joe mentioned, and I am a shark researcher and marine conservationist. And I'm lucky to call myself a National Geographic Explorer, and so I want to thank Joe first and foremost for inviting me to speak to you all today. This is me holding a very small sharp nose shark from Australia. But I didn't grow up doing shark research or even diving. I grew up in the mountains of Pennsylvania, where there are there is not a easy access to the ocean, but I followed my dreams of doing shark work, and, and now that's what I do. But I do that from the Cook Islands. So Joe showed you a much nicer map than what I have, but I just wanted to show you that we are out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in fact, in the South Pacific. You'll see there we're, we're south of the equator. But I feel quite lucky because this is the island that I live on. It's called Rarotonga. You'll notice it's, um, it's very mountainous. So this is what we call a volcanic island. 
And I am also lucky to do research on other Cook Islands, like, oh, we've got a little delay, pardon. That's okay, I can see the video playing on my end. Great. So this is the island called Penryn. So Penryn is an atoll, which is different from a volcanic island. The Cook Islands are made up of 15 islands. Some are atolls. Rarotonga is the only volcanic. Um, but one thing that's sure about all of them is they're very beautiful. So I feel very fortunate to live here. This is a view, a drone view, of the Penryn Island Lagoon. So you'll see um, those brown patches in the middle. Those are actually coral heads, and they are inside the reef. And then as we pan up here, You'll notice you can see the bits of land that are covered with sand and palm trees, and they are they they rise maybe six feet out of out of the ground, so they're very low lying. And then you see the line of white, which is the outer reef, and then we look onto the broader ocean. So I have had the opportunity to visit uh, Penryn in the recent past. This is the outline of the Cook Islands. So I bet all of you on here know what the shape of your state or the shape of your country looks like. For the Cook Islanders, their country um, is surrounded by water. So you'll see here this black, this black line uh, outlines the Cook Islands, what they call exclusive economic zone. And then inside, you'll see little circles. Now, the outside black line actually shows the area that is a shark sanctuary. And as Joe mentioned, I had the, the chance to work on that and get that uh, legislated in 2012. And inside those red lines, we have further protection under Marae Moana. So within 50 nautical miles of each island, we're not allowed to go fishing um, or mine the seabed. And then in all of the Cook Islands, sharks are considered protected. So I have an organization called Shark Specific. What we do is research, outreach, and we do policy work. So our research informs the policy, and we do outreach to talk to everyone, whether it's community members, you guys, politicians, to try to get conservation measures. So for our research, I'm going to talk most about that today. We're doing what I like to call explore and discover. I'm an explorer, as we mentioned, and I love to try to make discoveries. But what's lucky for me is that no one has ever done shark research in the Cook Islands where I live. So all of the work that we're doing is brand new. So we're learning what sharks are in the area, how do people feel about them, and potentially even discovering new species. We're also looking at the movement patterns of sharks. So I want to know where sharks are traveling with respect to that outline of the Cook Islands country. I'm also looking at how sharks and fishermen get along, or in most cases, how they don't. And then I'm trying to get more Cook Islanders in science because we don't actually have a whole lot of Cook Islanders doing uh, marine biology. In fact, we don't have anyone that's from the Cook Islands doing shark research. So a lot of what I'm doing is trying to get Cook Islanders more engaged in science so they can then take over this work. So we do, we look at all different types of sharks. We look at reef sharks, also at pelagic sharks. What that means is these sharks live their lives in the open ocean. They don't really come up to the reef very often. And we're also looking at rays. And so you might be scratching your head wondering why I'm looking at sharks and rays, but it turns out that rays and sharks are cousins. And that is because their skeletons are made of cartilage. So if you feel your earlobes or the tip of your nose, that's cartilage and that's what their bodies are made out of. They're called cartilaginous fishes. And because they both have cartilaginous bodies, um, they are, they're similar. And so I'm studying them. But I can't look at and try to protect sharks and rays without thinking about fish. Because the reason that some sharks are in trouble is because they are overfished. So we must look at um, both the reef fish and the fish in the open ocean, such as tuna and swordfish. And of course, who's doing the fishing and the protecting? That's people. So everything that we do with Shark Specific and with my research is working with the people. So I'm gonna go through our bit of our research now. We talked about explore and discover. What I'm trying to do is create baseline data. This really gives us a starting point because if we're working for protection and we don't have a place to start from, then we can't measure any difference as to whether or not we've protected sharks. And I'm doing that in a several ways, but in um, one of these ways is called baited remote underwater video systems. You'll see this here. There's um, you see this long pole has bait inside of it, so it has crushed fish, and you'll notice that these fish are attracted to the bait. And then if you, if you look back from the pole, 
you'll see that there is a circular housing. Inside that housing is a GoPro. And these cameras I set at different depths around the reef. So from about, let's call it 15 feet to up to 100 feet. And what I'm trying to do with the bait is to bring sharks across the camera. So when they swim in front of the camera, I'll have an idea who's around and in what um, numbers. So we deploy these bruvs from the side of the boat. And we do that using a rope. And then I'm gonna show you guys some footage. So here's an example of the bruvs footage that we get. I want you guys to note how many sharks you see in this, what we're gonna call frame right now. So I see one shark swimming across the frame, then there's a second that enters. So you'll also notice we can see different types of fish in there. We see a long trumpet fish in the background. We can see coral reefs. We can look at the coral reef cover. We can look for coral reef bleaching. So while these cameras um, are targeting shark abundance and presence, we're also able to gather a lot more information from the cameras. So one of the things that we're trying to do, as we mentioned, explore and discover and create baselines is, I want to know what species are there and in what relative abundance. And I say relative because we don't have an exact number because we haven't looked at every spot on the reef. But I'm looking at the maximum number of sharks at any time that I pause the camera. So I know that you guys are all very smart and you can count how many sharks are in this frame, right? So there's two. Now look at this frame. Can you guys just take a minute and try to count every piece of shark that you see in this frame? I'm gonna count with you. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So what we would say is that the maximum number of sharks in this frame is 15. And we also have a very grumpy looking red snapper here. So this is, a, this is some footage from Penryn, which is the atoll that I showed you earlier. Penryn right now has the most sharks that we have seen in any of the drops that we have done. We have found 22 sharks per frame. Here's just an example. These are gray reef sharks, so they live on the reef. And you'll note they're, they're hanging out above what we call a drop-off, which is an area where the reef slope drops dramatically. It's quite steep. And there's usually a lot of upwelling there, which brings a lot of fish for sharks. We also have been able to see a lot of rays with this footage. So these are called spotted eagle rays. This is from the island called Aitutaki, which is here in the Cook Islands. So I want you guys to have a look here and see if you can count the number of eagle rays in this clip. If you can look quite carefully down in the bottom here, it's a little bit hard to see, but you'll see these uh, sort of shadows swirling. This is actually an entire school of scalloped hammerhead sharks, which is really exciting for us. So note that these guys are not coming close to the bait camera. So what this really means is that we just got lucky. We happened to drop the camera in this location, the eagle rays and the scalloped hammerhead sharks were passing by. So we don't always, we don't just look at sharks as we mentioned. So this is a hawksbill sea turtle that was coming up to check out the camera. And I can promise you that these guys are very funny. So this hawksbill spent about 45 minutes of our camera trying to get the food out of that bait bag. So we do drop the cameras um, all around the reef at different depths, but we let them record for approximately one hour each. So it turns out that every time we do research on one of these islands, we have usually 100 or more hours of footage to watch. And sometimes we see some really funny stuff. So this octopus is trying to steal my camera. I should also mention that this camera is weighted down with almost 10 pounds of weight. So it just goes to show you how strong it is. Now I want you to pay attention. Do you notice the drummer fish biting it in the head?
So it turns out we've also discovered that octopuses are quite good boxers. <laughs> So those are just some of the gems of footage that we get um, from setting cameras around the reef. And then I'm also doing shark tagging. And the reason I'm doing shark tagging is to find out where those sharks are going. So that I'm targeting two different species or types of sharks. And the sharks that I'm targeting for, the set for tagging are the pelagic sharks, so the one that travel very long distances in the open ocean. This is an oceanic white tip shark, and this is a silky shark. I'm targeting both of these sharks because they're both threatened with extinction from overfishing. So the more information we can gather, the better we can do in trying to, to advocate for their protection. So we place two types of tags. The first is called ocean tag, and you'll notice there. for us. So shark specific, that's our organization. And we ask if any fishermen were to catch the shark, they send us the length of the shark and location to this email address. This is where the, the identification tag goes. This is the dorsal fin or that top fin of the shark that you'll often see sticking out of the water in photos. The second type of tag that we place is called a satellite tag. The satellite tags allow us to track the movement of the sharks, both um, vertically, so as they dive, and also horizontally, so we can look for distance traveled away from the islands and outside of the Cook Islands country. So the placement of the satellite tag he goes here. So it's not in the tip of the dorsal fin, but rather in the back, just below the dorsal fin. So how to catch a shark. So I have the lucky job that I get to go out and try to catch sharks in these beautiful locations. But you'll learn later that it's not all fun and games. So this is a blue shark, and at the bottom of, uh, of this orange float is a hook. So we do have to catch them, but in order to do that, we need bait. So we often work with local fishermen to um, buy the fish that they aren't able to sell to others. And that sometimes means that we get fish that's a little older and possibly a little stinkier. <laughs> We put bait on the end of the hooks, and then sharks are attracted to fish, so they will then bite the hook, and we'll allow them to tire themselves a little out a little bit by fighting that orange ball. So just to show you, this is a silky shark. So we will pull the shark then alongside the boat once it's, um, once it's tired itself out, and then we will secure the shark to the side of the boat using ropes. Now we do this for the shark safety and our own, and this usually happens quite quickly. So in this instance, uh, Marino and Tiri E are working with <laughs> quite a feisty dusky shark. So this is another dusky shark. You'll notice that it's nice and calm. So we secure it with a rope by the tail and one behind the jawline. And that allows us then to turn the shark upside down into what's called tonic immobility, which is a stress response, but it allows them to basically go to sleep. And then we can continue our work. So the first thing we'll do is we'll measure the shark. So we do that from the tip of the snout all the way to, um, to the tail. And then once we've measured the shark, we'll place an identification tag in there. So remember that the identification tag goes into the dorsal fin. And then if it's the correct species, which was, remember we talked about silky shark and oceanic white tip shark, we'll also place a satellite tag, which you can see here on the back. So can you guys uh, can you guys tell me what is the identification tag number of this shark? It's 100. So we will record information that tells us that satellite or shark number 100 has a satellite tag and it's a silky shark. And then once we've uh, placed the tags in, we'll take a small clip of the fin for DNA analysis. And then the fun part begins. We get to release the shark. So here's a quick video of us releasing a blue shark. So all of the tagging work that we do takes place in less than five minutes, and we always remove the hook. Ready? Three, two, one, release. <laughs> So that's a blue shark release. We're lucky in the Cook Islands that the water is so clear. So we're able to see the shark swim away. And you'll notice it swims away with a lot of energy. So that means the shark is fine. And then it's going to go off and give us data. But sometimes things don't go as planned, right? So this is a bent hook. So we had a shark that was so strong that once it fought the buoy, it actually bent our hook and, and escaped. And other times, because I mentioned that we get old bait, 
we almost throw up. Come on, people. And it's not just us, but everyone on the boat. So these are the videos I like to show when everyone thinks that I have the most glamorous job in the world. I do work in paradise, but I often work in paradise in not so wonderful conditions. So there were maggots all over that bait. Um, and if, if, uh, if a video could, could, could transmit smell, I would love to include you all in that. And then other times we're working in the pouring rain and at night. So sharks, they aren't on our sleeping schedule. Um, they are more active in the early, early morning and at night. So that often means we're up at awful hours um, and in any conditions. But we love what we do. And this is clear. This is Teudu. She's a local Cook Islander who studied marine science. She's tagging her very first shark. And when it's hard to find these sharks, it makes it that much more exciting when we do them. So the reason we're so excited is because we mentioned that the sharks that we're targeting, oceanic white tips and silky sharks, are, are open ocean sharks. That means they travel very long distances. But it also means that because they're threatened with extinction, there are fewer of them in the ocean. So you couple that with the fact that they travel very long distances, and it means they're just not that easy to find. So sometimes we go weeks of effort and hours and hours and hours on the water with the smelly bait in the rain without catching a shark. So when we do actually catch one and we get a tag deployed, we are very excited. But I'd like to point out to you guys a few things about my work. Number one is that I am not from the ocean. I grew up in a tiny mountain town in Pennsylvania, but I'm doing shark work. But also number two is that anyone can do this with their curiosity and passion. So this is Adu. He's a 10 year old student from Omoka in Penryn and he got a chance to come out and drop some bruvs with us. Also, these are the students from Ottawa College in Aitutaki. They are 14 and 15 years old, and they had the opportunity to spend a few days with us dropping baited cameras as well. And finally, everything that we do, we work alongside the community. Because when we're looking for protection, when we're trying to get information on sharks, there's no one with better information or who cares more than the people who live there. So this is the community that we worked with in Penryn Island. And um, we're all extremely excited about the shark work that we've done. So I'm going to pause there and just say thank you so much for allowing me to present a little bit about what I do. And now I'm really excited to hear any questions you guys might have. All right, Jess, thank you so much for sharing. That was awesome. And I would take the smelly fish over the mountains of snow that I have right now <laughs> uh, any day. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's meet some of our classrooms. Uh, Jess, if you just hit the green button again, that should bring you back to us. There we go. We got gotcha. you. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, just a quick reminder to any classrooms who are tuning in live via YouTube, uh, let us know where you're watching from, send us in a question or two, and we'll keep an eye out for those questions. I also want to give a shout out to Mrs. Wafer, who's joining us from Laurel Springs uh, School. They're a virtual school, so they're students uh, tuning in from online from all over the world. So Mrs. Wafer, I will visit you a little bit later and see if you have any questions uh, from your group that either came into your email or via the chat. But for now, let's meet a classroom. Let's go to Mrs. Cobble's class. They're hanging out with us from Concord, North Carolina. Let's turn their microphone on and see how they're doing today. How are we doing, boys and girls? Hi. Hi. Go ahead with your question. What advice would you give to someone who wants to be a scientist? I would say the very first thing you can do is just be curious. So if you see a frog, you might wonder, how did that frog grow? How many babies does it have? Where does it live? Where does it eat? You start to ask questions so that you can then paint a picture um, 
of what that frog does. If you want to study trees, you might start by asking your parents if you can, can have a seed and plant a tree in the backyard and observe it. And then over time, you continue to ask questions and make observations. Then we begin to come up with facts. Um, so that's the basis of science is curiosity and then continuing to ask questions. So never settle for, oh, well, I think that this tree grows without sunlight. You would want to take that tree, put it in the shade and see if it grows, right? And then if it doesn't grow, then you put it back outside and you see if it grows in sunlight. So I would say be curious and don't, don't stop asking questions. All right. Good question and an excellent answer. Uh, let's see. Mrs. Hart's class is joining us from San Jose, California. We've got some fifth graders. Let's get their microphone turned on. Okay. How are we doing in fifth grade? Hi. 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 Hey, guys. Um, does it hurt the sharks when you, like, put the tags on them? So the good news is where we put the tags, the sharks, they don't have the same uh, neurophysiology that we do as humans. So while we don't know what's in their brains, we know that they don't actually have the same mechanisms to feel pain the same way that humans do. All right, and I've heard it likened to maybe kind of like getting your ear pierced. The cartilage, you don't really feel it as much as you would somewhere else. All right, let's see. Um, let's go to Mrs. Gross Hagerty's group. They're hanging out with us in Benicia, California. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing. Okay. How's it going, boys and girls? Hi. Hello. Okay. What type of sharks live near Cook Island? Oh, wait, hold on for a second. Oh, well, that's a very good question. So we have, uh, since we have coral reefs, so for example, there are no coral reefs in California, so they, California won't have gray reef sharks, for example. But here in the Cook Islands, we do. So we have um, reef sharks such as um, tiger sharks, we have gray reef sharks, we have white tip reef sharks, black tip reef sharks, and then we also have the sharks that swim in the open ocean, such as hammerhead sharks, um, we have blue sharks, we have mako sharks, we have um, oceanic white tips and silky sharks. Do you know about any of the sharks that live in California? Do we? Yes. Great yes. whites. <laughs> 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 I would ask you guys to have a look at what species have been found in California. And you can compare those to the different types that I've just told you about that live here in the Cook Islands. Okay. All right, there you go, some homework from Jess. Uh, let's see, let's go to Mrs. Caesar's class. Grade six is hanging out with us in Prince George, British Columbia. Let's get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, British Columbia? <laughs> Um, what kind of schooling did you have to do to be a marine biologist? Sorry, could you repeat that? I, there was a little delay on my end. Um, nice and clear. What kind of schooling did you have to do to be a marine biologist? Okay, what kind of schooling did I have to do? Well, first I needed to take a bunch of science classes. So when I was in middle school and high school, I paid a lot of attention to science. And I also paid attention to um, geography, to um, social sciences, because when we're doing marine biology, we're often working with people, we're working in interesting locations. Um, we want to know what the area that we're studying is like. So I pay attention to a lot of studies, our subjects in school. And then when I went to university, I studied biology. Um, so I didn't go to a school that had marine biology as an option, so I was able to study biology and then through practical experience get um, experience in marine biology. And then now I'm doing a PhD uh, in sharks. So I will be done with that in about six months, um, but not everyone has to go through to get a PhD. But for me, I'm running projects on my own in an interesting location, so it was the right path for me. All right. Let's take a quick trip now to Gunnison, Colorado. We have some students joining us. Let's get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Colorado? Good. Good. Gavin, do you want to ask What is the most endangered shark and what is being done to protect them? That's a great question. So the most endangered shark would be something that we call critically endangered. 
So that's um, a classification level set by this international organization called CITES, okay? So there are several sharks that are critically endangered, but the one that I would say is the most endangered that I can talk about is called a sawfish, and it's technically a ray. And what's being done is that in places where sawfish still exist, the communities and the governments are coming up with plans to try to reduce fishing and create areas where they can still um, live and procreate. All right. Uh, let's check in with Mrs. Wafer and see if you have some questions for us from the online community. I do. And thank you so much, Jess. We can really hear the passion in your voice and in your words. And um, I have students in Hawaii, Panama City, New Jersey, Virginia, California, and I'm just having such a hard time deciding. There's lots of students, a few students in Hawaii or who will be visiting Hawaii. Adam O is in fifth grade. He will be visiting Hawaii. So he's curious about snorkeling in Hawaii. Mika lives in Hawaii. She's in sixth grade and she's curious about the endangered sharks there. And then finally, Christian lives in Hawaii also and is wondering about the cook. And I'm, I'm looking because the students are texting me, but they're also in a virtual classroom. Um, Christian is wondering about plastic pollution um, in the Cook Islands, if you see that. And we're going to be doing a plastics in the past week coming up where we're going to try to reduce our plastic use at Laurel Springs School. So I think that's really um, uh, an important question. So I hope I haven't bombarded you with too much, um, too many questions. No, I can take those pretty, um, pretty easily. So I'll start with snorkeling in Hawaii. Um, snorkeling in Hawaii is going to be similar to where I live. The water is very clear. Um, they are volcanic islands, so they're going to, you know, um, have beautiful coral reefs. Um, I think that some, you know, to be a scientist, I would say look underwater in the different places that you snorkel and look and see if the if there's different colors and types of coral and if there's different types and uh, abundance of fish. But um, if you see a shark, you'll be very lucky because um, there are uh, there are a number of sharks, but um, seeing them while you're snorkeling is actually quite, uh, quite a treat. And then I can take the plastics question in the Cook Islands. So the population in the Cook Islands is quite small. There are only about 15,000 people in the entire country. But in fact, we here in the Cook Islands still pick up plastic off the beaches because not everyone um, uses reusable bags, um, disposes of their plastic in the correct recycling bin, um, and still, you know, there are people who come to visit uh, who will throw their rubbish on the, uh, on the ground. So that, that's unfortunate. But I will say that um, compared with some places, you know, we are really out there in the middle of nowhere. And so we have less plastic uh, that washes up on the beaches than, than most places that I've been. In general, it's very clean. All right. Great questions. Uh, Mr. Shri Vogel, he is in Holcomb, Kansas. Let's get their microphone turned on and see how his class is doing. There it is. How are we doing, Texas? Or sorry, Kansas. 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 Um, what? <laughs> what did you go on? <laughs> what did you have to do to become a National Geographic Explorer? Like, what steps did you take to do that? So my path to becoming an explorer is a little different than, um, than some others. So similar to Joe, I had a project I was very passionate about, and I did that with no promise of reward without looking for reward. So Joe founded Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and National Geographic thought that was so awesome that he woke up to an email one day that said, hey, you're so amazing that you're now a National Geographic Explorer. So kudos to Joe. Um, and I felt very lucky that I was working on a, a project I'm extremely passionate about, which is the Shark Sanctuary. And um, through just dedication, working without any promise of reward, I woke up to a similar email that said, hey, you know, someone recognized the hard work that you've put in and you are now a National Geographic Explorer. So if, and I'm just gonna add to that a little more, there are other ways to become an explorer and that's to apply for a grant um, for a project that you're passionate about. So no matter what, um, National Geographic is this incredible organization that really responds to, to passion, to commitment and to excellence. So if it's something that you're interested in doing, I would say whatever your passion project is, do that and do it very well. 
All right, thank you, Jess. And I would just add a little bit to that. Um, there are young or young grantees, so early career grants for as early as uh, your early college and university years that you can apply for. And then any teachers who are tuning in, there's education grants now. You can apply for grants for projects within your own classroom from National Geographic. So it's really cool all the different opportunities there are uh, to work with National Geographic. Um, all right, let us start visiting some of our classrooms again. So uh, let's fire up the microphone in Mrs. Cobble's class again and see if they have another question. We do have another question. Go ahead and ask yours. Why did you want to study sharks? That is a very good question. Um, the reason I wanted to study sharks is because they are misunderstood. So, you know, a lot of the movies, in fact, even today, The Meg came out, The Shallows, um, they portray sharks as these man-eating monsters. And while there are occasions where sharks do bite people, um, they are not man-eating monsters. We have millions and millions and millions of people entering the oceans every year um, with very few interactions with sharks. But unfortunately, because we love to eat fish, which I also love to eat fish, but the methods that we use to eat fish um, sometimes attract sharks as well. And so sharks are in trouble. And you couple that with them being misunderstood. And I felt like, you know what? This is an animal that I could jump in and try to help protect. All right, let's go to Mrs. Hart's class. If you guys have another question, your microphone is on. Okay, we do. Um, why are they called silky sharks? That's a really good question. Um, so sharks have what are called dermal denticles, which is what their, that's, that's their skin. And in one direction, they feel very smooth. And then if you were to rub your hand in the other direction, they feel like sandpaper. But silky sharks in particular, they have this beautiful shine to their skin that's almost silky. So it's a little bit um, silly, but it's really, it has to do with, with their skin. All right, good question. Uh, Mrs. Caesar's group in British Columbia, your microphone is on again. Uh, well, I am wondering, uh, what is your favorite shark? That is a very good, my favorite? What's your favorite? The Mako, I guess. The Mako? Makos are incredible. Did you know they're, they're like the acrobats of the sea? They can jump 30, 40 feet out of the water and do flips. <laughs> so my favorite shark is probably a hammerhead shark. Um, and I like them because they, they swim in packs, the scalloped hammerheads. They have eyes on the sides of their heads. Um, they can use their hammer-shaped uh, foil to help them turn in the water column. And I just find them very interesting because their um, ability to detect electrical impulses is, is a bit better than other sharks. All right, uh, Mrs. Gross Hagerty's class, your microphone is on. Um, do sharks ever pass gas? <laughs> uh, I, ha I, I have no idea. I'm inclined to say no, but I will get back to you, okay? I promise. <laughs> it's a great question. All right, you never know. Some of the questions that you've maybe never been asked before come on Explorer Classroom. Uh, let's see, let's go back to our group in Colorado. Let me turn your microphone on. Hi, Madison, go ahead. Um, do you live in Cook Islands full-time or just part-time and what kind of house do you live in? That's a great question. I live in the Cook Islands full-time. So I've been here since 2011 and I live in a house that actually has no address. So my actual, uh, the way I describe my house is I live on the, in the greenhouse on stilts in Rutucky. So my house, um, it sits up on poles and it's green and it has a big porch where chickens fly up, which you heard as I was giving my presentation um, and visit me. All right, the greenhouse on stilts. Uh, Mrs. Wafer, do you have another question from your online community? I do. I have two seventh graders with two questions about shark bites. So Julian is in North Carolina and wants to know which shark has the most powerful bite. And then I'm reading Rebecca's question from Spring, Texas. Do sharks ever bite or kill each other? Right. So because we are curious explorers and we're interested in science, I'm going to ask you guys to Google and to figure out which shark has the strongest bite. I'll give you a few clues. It's probably one of the bigger sharks that swims in the open ocean. 
So I'm going to ask you guys to look that up and you can look at bite power. You can look at bite power and bite force of sharks versus say crocodiles. So I'm going to ask you guys to look that one up because you don't need me to tell you. Um, as far as sharks eating each other, yes. So the sand tiger shark, their embryo actually eat each other inside, inside the womb. So they are truly survival of the fittest. And then we have other sharks that prey upon smaller sharks. So for example, um, a great hammerhead shark might eat gray reef sharks or a bull shark might eat um, a smaller reef shark. So we have in the ocean what are called, um, you know, in a food web, for example, it's um, trying not to use a big scientific word, but um, trophic levels. So we hear about sharks being called apex predators. So they're at the top. And then we'll have other sharks that are sort of a level down. And so often that means the sharks at the top are, are happy to feed on the sharks that are below them. All right, and we'll visit uh, Kansas one more time. Mr. Shri Vogel's class, let's get their microphone on again. Hello, my name is Dave. Hi. Okay, so, so there's a scientific word for a shark because it can like, uh, like, like it has some sort of electro something in its nose, and Correct. ends with Lorenzini or something like, or something like that. I forgot what it's called. Yes, it's called ampullae of Lorenzini, oh. and um, sharks have a snout. <laughs> so on the underside of their snout, and if you're a hammerhead shark, it's on the underside of your foil. So you have these little jelly-filled sacs which are attached to the ampullae of Lorenzini and they can detect electrical impulses in, in the ocean. So it helps them hunt. Was that your question or is there a second part to it? No, that was it. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, Jess, it is always so great to talk to you from the Cook Islands. I can remember two years before I became an immersion explorer, uh, you became one. I remember reaching out to you right away to ask you to, to do a classroom event and you've always been so generous with your time. Uh, and hanging out with classrooms. So thank you so much for not only hanging out with the classrooms, but the awesome conservation work that you're doing. Um, again, I'm looking at the snow out my window and I am very jealous of your day to day. Thanks guys. Um, and if you're interested more in my work, you can follow me on um, Instagram. I'm at Jess Adwater. So I post a lot about the work that I do. Um, and the same with shark specific. So we are at shark specific and you can learn more about fishing and shark tagging and all of that. And I can answer your questions as well. So Perfect. thanks very much everyone for listening and thanks Joe for having me. Perfect, thanks again, Jess. Thank you classrooms for all your awesome questions. And let's turn the microphones on nice and loud. Let's get a goodbye and thank you from our classrooms. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone, for hanging out. We have one more event uh, on the 27th with Dalal Hanna at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. So join us for that one. Also, check out March events at natgeographic.org under education. You can find Explorer Classroom. Thanks again, Jess, and thanks again to all the classrooms. Thanks, guys.